to you, thankfully. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and time is 7.03. Thank you for joining us this evening. Today is May 19th, 2015, and this is the Municipal Budget Committee. If everyone would rise to pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all of those viewing and anyone who will be watching the reruns, tonight is a little bit of an unusual meeting. Um, it is a regular meeting of the Municipal Budget Committee. However, tonight we will conduct no regular business. Instead, we have joining us this evening to conduct a seminar on the Municipal Budget Process, Barbara Reed and Attorney Stephen Buckley. Just if you would indulge me for a minute, I'm going to read your bios. Well, you're not just anybody joining us this evening, I'm sorry. But I do have to read it because as I get older, I can't memorize it all. Uh, Barbara focuses, Barbara's official title is the Government Finance Advisor at NHMA, and Barbara focuses on municipal financial operations and provides financial analysis of legislative changes on local governments. Before joining NHMA in 2005, Barbara was with the New Hampshire Department of Revenue Administration for 18 years, serving most of that time as the Assistant Commissioner. Barbara is also a certified public accountant, holds a BA degree from Mount St. Mary College and an MBA degree from New Hampshire College and a graduate certificate in forensic accounting. That almost sounds scary. <laughs> and fraud examination from yeah. Southeastern New Hampshire University. <laughs> All of it. That is a mouthful. Thank you very much for, for honoring us this evening and being with us. And then we have attorney Stephen Buckley, um, who is the Legal Services Counsel. Mr. Buckley, attorney Buckley directs NHMA's Legal Services Program with responsibility for providing legal advice to members and overseeing training programs and educational publications for municipal officials. Very important that we have someone somewhere who can round up all this information for us and inform us as to what we do when we serve our towns. He practiced law from 1984 to 2014 with the firm Hage Hodes, a PA concentrating in representing municipalities. In his hometown of Bow, Steve was a member of the planning board for 12 years and served as a member of the budget committee. Dare say you, you were one of us. <laughs> he is a past chairman and a current member of the executive committee of the Central New Hampshire Regional Planning Commission and is currently vice chairman of the New Hampshire Association of Regional Planning Commissions. Steve received his BA from San Diego State University and his JD from Franklin Pierce Law Center. I thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Before we start um, this evening, we had sent an invitation to town manager um, and select board and the department heads. We have a few empty chairs up here and we have only one person in the audience and that's Mary Louise Wolseley, our, one of our selectmen. So Mary Louise, rather than have you sit there, why don't you join us at the table? I would be delighted. Thank you. I don't think anyone has an objection to that. Oh, I do. I'd like to see that happen. Okay. With that being said, I am going to turn it over. This is a two-hour seminar. Um, I am going to just give these instructions. This is basically the eight-hour seminar compacted into two hours. I don't want to spend too much time talking. Um, for that reason, any questions, as I understand it, can be submitted in writing but will not be addressed tonight. So this is an information only um, seminar, and with Welcome that, the table. I turn it over to you entirely. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Again, Steve Buckley, and uh, obviously here with Barbara Reed. Uh, I didn't want to say at the outset, in my job as the Legal Services Council, I spend 60 to 70 percent of my time answering inquiries from local officials like you. And since I've joined NHMA in May of last year, I'm very privileged to do that work 
It's very rewarding work. Um, I enjoy it a great deal, and I especially enjoy getting out amongst local officials and doing these presentations like this. Uh, I do want to take a few minutes to go over the packets you all have. Um, now, the chair mentioned that um, you can submit questions that we will uh, answer later on through legal inquiries. So each of you in your packet have a yellow card. So if you just want to note where that is. So if you have a particular question you want to bring to our attention, please fill it out. Please be sure you give us your contact information. And we will, it, whatever your preference is, if you want us to give you a call, we'll call you on the telephone, or we'll send a reply by email. So that's what the cards are for. A um, couple of things that are also in your packet. You've also got the Basic Law of Budgeting, which is a publication we put out every two years. This is the publication that came out in 2013. It's used by Barbara and her other confreres in the budget and finance arena to present budget and finance seminars in uh, uh, September and October. This one has an update from 2014. We will, we will be presenting a new version of this document in the fall of this year, but this is a, a valuable resource that you should all consider as a way to answer your questions on budget and finance matters. And we also have a copy of, of the PowerPoint presentation we're giving you today. So you have that as a reference, so you can uh, not, not don't need to take notes. You'll have the actual PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'm going to let Barbara go through the other materials that she has. She can either address it now or later. But uh, the other thing I want to bring to your attention, in the materials we also have a mark your calendar, save the dates. Yeah. Our budget and finance workshops are scheduled in September of this year. So this card will give you those dates, September 15th in Manchester, September 24th in Attitash. So you might be inclined to go to the, the Manchester version, although Attitash is beautiful that time of year. Uh, two other things I want to, a couple other things I want to mention. We are about to come out with a brand new edition of our publication on called The Hard Road to Travel. It may not necessarily be directly applicable to budget committee members, but knowing the impacts of road and highway law certainly is a potential thing that you might want to be aware of. Which, uh, if I can just say, hasn't been updated in 10 years? It has not been updated since, since 2004, so a brand new version is coming out. Um, there is another uh, thing that, again, may not be of great interest to budget committee members, but annually we do a municipal law lecture series, which is mostly focused on land use and planning matters, and that announcement for those law lectures taking place in the fall is also in there. And finally, but not at leastly, uh, the Save the Date flyer for our annual conference, which is coming up on Thursday and Friday, November 19th and 20th. So, Barbara, did you want to go across uh, those other materials or no, wait till we... I'll wait till, because they're, they're part of my presentation. Okay, so Barbara's presentation is going to be uh, the second half. The first half will be by me, which will be focused on um, this agenda, which we'll just talk about briefly. I'm going to talk about general principles with regards to the law of budgeting for municipalities. We're going to talk about key budget concepts and the budget committee and the things that the budget, budget committee does and the authority the budget committee has. And then Barbara's going to talk about financing options, property taxes, and as I understand it, she's also going to make you do a little arithmetic where you're going to actually <laughs> calculate a tax rate. So you're going to do a little exercise uh, and, and you won't get it, well, there'll be no test on it, but you'll be able to say that you learned how to do a tax rate. So uh, with that, let me start. Um, the first thing I think it's always important to remind people when you're dealing with a New Hampshire municipality is, is the general concept that we're not a home rule state. So when you're trying to decide what does a municipality do, what can it do, you first have to find a law that allows you to take a specific action. So our, our no home rule state um, is one where if you have a desire to take a certain concrete action, so for instance, um, I recently have received questions from towns seeking permission to adopt ordinances that would ban plastic bags at retail establishments. And so we had to research, does that city or town have the authority to ban plastic bags? So that's the kind of thing we have to figure out. And if we can't find a law that says you can do it, we basically don't agree that the town can do it, and if the <coughs> law says, no law says we can do it, it's, we, we, if no law says you can't do it, it's not enough to say, yes, we can go ahead and do this activity. So we really have to find some statute that says this specific action by the municipality is authorized. Um, now, when you're dealing with the budget and, and the activities of the budget <coughs> committee, 
uh, and moving forward to the adoption of the budget by the town meeting, or it could be the adoption of a budget by a city council or a town council. Um, the really principal statute is RSA Chapter 32. The statute applies to all cities and towns, regardless of whether or not they have an official budget committee. And there are specific provisions that, that apply to a town has adopted a budget committee. But the statute applies to every city and town, uh, the basic general principles. And then beyond that, if you have a budget committee, certain other additional rules apply to that town that has a budget committee. Um, and many towns will add, who have charters, will add provisions um, concerning the activities of the budget committee um, if uh, they choose to do so in their charter adoption documents. The purpose of the budget law is to provide a uniform method of appropriating spending public funds. And this, again, <coughs> applies to towns, school districts, village districts um, that do not have operating budget committees. It, it's a uniform law that governs how uh, monies are appropriated and how they're, uh, they're uh, legally appropriated, how monies are uh, kept in the budget, how they lapse, and how the money is eventually uh, becomes, uh, it goes into the general fund and, and or the unreserved fund balance. Um, one of the other principles that's important to keep in mind with regards to the Budget Act, or RSA Chapter 32, uh, is that it does impose penalties for failure to abide by the requirements of the Budget Act the failure to abide by the bottom line appropriated by the town meeting, because towns can't spend money more than what's been appropriated by the town meeting or by the city or town council. You can't spend money without an appropriation. There are always exceptions. And you always have to have a specific place in the budget that says you can spend the dollars for this particular purpose. Um, so violators who uh, do not abide by these limitations in the Budget Act, they can be removed from office by on petition. Um, and that petition can be brought by budget committee members or any interested member of the public. Now, removal for violation of the Budget Act is not automatic, but if there is a clear, serious violation of these duties to not spend with an out of appropriation or to overexpend the bottom line approved by the town meeting, those can be matters upon which a budget committee or a member of the public can seek to move, remove either a town administrator, other members of the administration, or uh, of governing body members. The other significant power which is inherent in the Budget Act, and it's and not only in RSA Chapter 32, but RSA RSA 21-J, which is the statute in the, the, the ways in which the town, uh, the, the state government organizes its departments. The Department of Revenue Administration's authorities found in RSA Chapter 21-J. That statute gives the DRA, the Department of Revenue Administration, to disallow any attempt to raise inappropriate funds if it's not done correctly. So, uh, although this would probably be interrupted by your bond counsel, if you don't hold the, the appropriate public hearing to raise an appropriate money by bonded indebtedness for more than $100,000, not only will you not get the, get the ability to borrow the money, but DRA will disallow the appropriation. This DRA will also disallow, if you don't know this, I'll tell you one of the things they will disallow. If you have an existing capital reserve fund, DRA has taken the position, I'm not sure they're 100% correct, but this is their position. If you want to put more money into an existing capital reserve fund, it has to be a separate warrant article. You can't appropriate money to an existing capital reserve fund from your budget. There are many towns that used to do that. DRA takes the position that RSA Chapter 35 does not allow that. So if you take any budgetary action on the floor of the town meeting or through the warrant that they believe is illegal, they will disallow the appropriation. And if you're not familiar with the process, um, they will disallow from the last article. They'll just go, they'll just assume from the article that is being disallowed, and they'll just assume that the town meeting didn't mean to appropriate those dollars, and they just start chopping the, the articles from that point back up the warrant. And, and then they reach the point where the amount that's legally appropriated is allowed by them. That's so the 10% limit you're talking about. Well, 10% plus okay. they'll also, dis if you're disallowing an article too, right. Um, so those are the two significant forms of authority that the DRA has to control the activities of municipalities as to raise and appropriate money. Um, you might know this. I'll just, again, remind you of these terms. Whenever you hear the term legislative body, 
many statutes use the term town uh, or legislative body, that means the town meeting. So whenever a statute says the town may do something, that means it has to be done by the town meeting, and that's always the legislative body. The governing body is always the select board, or uh, it could be the school board, or it could be the village commissioners. So those two terms are always important because they're common concepts in the budget process. Um, now, budget committees are not required. As I said, the, the budget law is generally applicable to all towns, uh, is mandatorily applicable, uh, but a town may have decide to have a budget committee, which uh, I was on a budget committee, so I know how it works. I know it's fundamentally what it's all about is the 10 percent limitation, that the town meeting cannot raise an appropriate money above 10 percent of the total amount appropriate uh, recommended by the budget committee. That's your fundamental authority. Everything, as far as I'm concerned, when I was on the budget committee, everything you do comes down to that. Now, yes, you are you are have certain other activities that you do. You have to hold the final budget hearing. You have to sign the budget, et cetera. But the fundamental authority you have is you control the appropriation no more than 10 percent of the amount uh, recommended by the budget committee. Uh, so it really comes down to that. That's where the rubber hits the road. Um, and uh, as I said, there's an official budget committee under RSA 3214, but many towns do have advisory or unofficial budget committees. Um, but those just advise the select board and the town meeting. I know in many years a town that I represent, the town of Ware, they had a finance committee. It was an unofficial budget committee, but whenever an article came up on the warrant to be discussed to raise an appropriate money, the moderator always turned to the finance committee and said, and what does the finance committee think? They had no statutory authority, but they did have uh, some moral suasion over the budget. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of meetings for the budget committee. Uh, I, I don't know how you know the operative process goes in Hampton, but from my experience, uh, it, because I know that you're a calendar, uh, uh, you're not a fiscal year town, you're a calendar year town, typically you're looking at you know, you're, you're ramping up your budget process usually in September and October. I and mean, again, I don't know how Hampton operates because at, at that time you're, you're going to be getting prepared for the select board at some point getting a budget presented to them by the administration. And typically before that happens, the administration, the town manager or the town administrator has asked the department heads, give me your budgets for next year. And the, the town manager gets the budgets from the department heads, and the town manager cuts it down by 5 to 10 percent. And then the town manager sends the budget to the select board, and the select board cuts that down to 10, 5 to 10 percent. And then it finally comes to the budget committee. Now, my town, my, the budget authority would typically arrive on our desk somewhere in the middle of December. And that's pretty much when we would schedule budget hearings as discussed, discussed here. It could be an unlimited number. The way we handle our budget committees hearings is that we, uh, how you do it here, but we got a huge book with the whole budget in it, and we had one from the school board and one from the town, and we would schedule our hearings uh, pretty much all through the month of January and February, and we had, we had hearings twice a week, you know, one night was the select board, one night was the school board, and we just went through their budget line item by line item. Um, and. Uh, you know, the first year you're on a budget committee, it's pretty intimidating. And the, the thing that's most intimidating is that, you know, the budget numbers as they're generated to you from the school versus the town are completely different. You've got totally different, you know, you've got the town with all these uh, account numbers, and then you get the school has completely different account numbers. And that's because the Department of Education, which has a kind of semi regulatory authority over schools and how they do their budgets, they dictate that they have a totally different accounting system than towns. It's the way it is, and you're going to have to get familiar with it. So you go through all these uh, hearings, and you meet with all the, the, the administrators, and finally, you're going to finally have a budget hearing, um, and it has to be with seven days' notice. Um, and then at that budget hearing, you're going to recommend, you're going to sign the budget. You're going to say, this is what we're going to recommend. And I got to tell you, every year I was in the budget committee, I was trying to recommend a lower amount than it was approved by the select board or the, the, or the uh, uh, school board, but they never listened to me. I don't know why, but they never listened to me. Um, so, uh, and then, if, you know, you might have, I, I, you know, is Hampton SB2? Yes. So you have your deliberative session, yeah. uh, obviously, which is designed to discuss and debate the articles. 
and then you would have the voting session. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for the budget committee, the key issue that you might have is if the town meeting modifies some of the numbers in the budget uh, or in the um, separate warrant articles, you might modify your recommendations to go on the on the, the ballot because obviously you will, you recommended a budget of X and the town meeting has put my money and you may not recommend that budget. So that depends on what happens at the deliberative session. So the Kevin, seven key budget concepts are appropriations, gross basis budgeting, warrant notice, which just means that in order to have a legal budget, you have to give notice to the public that you're going to propose specific appropriations, that there's no spending without an appropriation, that appropriations generally, the standard operating procedure is all appropriations lapse at the end of the fiscal year, unless there's some reason why they wouldn't lapse. And we'll talk a little bit about when there's no lapsing. Um, and then there's the authority of the select board to transfer appropriations. Uh, and one of the things only I would say is I, you know, I know that people really like this no versus no means no and zero out all line items. But I think the best, most important tool a budget or a town budget committee or a town can have is always leave a placeholder in a line item. That gives flexibility to the governing body to move money around as necessary. There was, I kind of couldn't believe it. There was a. A, a library trustees who called me up the other day and said, oh, there's no problem with the fact that we decided to put a budget out that had zero dollars appropriated to buy books. And I said, uh, yeah, I, but he, he said, but it's gross-based budgeting. It, it, we're okay. And I said, no, no, you've just approved a budget that has no money appropriated to buy books, and you're a library. <laughs> and so, no, it doesn't work that way. You cannot spend money that year on books. You have to always leave a placeholder. And a dollar is always an appropriate way to have that placeholder so your governing body can have the authority to move money around as necessary because bottom line is the budget committee doesn't run the town. It's the, it's the, it's the select board or the school district. Um, and then, of course, the 10 percent limitation. You can't spend more than 10 percent of the amount recommended by the budget committee. That's the overall amount. And there's some dollars that are come out, like there's fixed amounts that come out of the 10 percent calculation. And Barbara can probably recite that better than I. But after you take those fixed numbers out, you have a number, and it's that number cannot be exceeded by 10 percent. Um, so another key concept, that key concept is the fact that there's an appropriation, which is the legislative body saying, like that uh, <laughs> budget for that library, they're going to set aside a specific sum of money for that purpose. And in that particular library budget, they decided to put zero for books. But you've got to have, you know, the, the town meeting, there's got to be an appropriation to spend money for that purpose. And it's an authorization to spend money, not the actual spending. So it's basically saying, we have agreed that there will be money spent this year on this subject. Now, the dollars come later. Um, and then appropriations, there's a number of terms to keep in mind. There's raise the money. Raise means we're going to identify the source of the dollars. It is going to be from general taxation. It's going to be from borrowing. It's going to be from capital reserve fund. That's the raise part. Uh, appropriate is to set it apart, to say we're going to raise and appropriate from the capital reserve fund a set of money aside from that capital reserve fund, which we saved before, to buy the fire truck this year. And the purpose under RC 32.3 is a goal or aim to be accomplished through the expenditure of public funds. And then it's, the reference is not limited by uh, the MS-6 or the MS-7. And I'm sure Barbara can remind me what these two forms are. Those are the um, DRA budget forms, and uh, one of them is if you have a budget committee, and the other is if you don't have a budget committee. However, I, I believe that they have renumbered all of their forms, yeah. so I think there's now a lot more numbers and uh, letters before their forms. But basically, you do have a budget form that gets submitted to DRA and has that column for the budget committee. It's column for the selectmen's recommended. So. Um, the point here is that DRA has these sort of broad categories, uh, and that's just the summary. So, for example, there may be patriotic purposes, where you may have budget line items under that for certain activities that you're having, but their form pretty much has those broad categories, police department, fire department, ambulance, patriotic purposes, general administration, and that's what those forms are. Okay, so I'm going to have to speed up just a little bit. I apologize because we, we, I did want to make sure you understand we did commit to do this in two hours, so I may speed up a little bit. But again, uh, you do have the PowerPoint in your materials, so if I go a little fast, remember it's still there. 
Um, so uh, appropriations, we have to talk a little bit about, has to be for a public purpose. Um, so uh, you can only spend money for a public purpose, and that's as indicated in our Constitution and by statute. School boards are limited to the support of public schools. Village districts have to be for the purpose for which the district is created. So you have village districts that do water, some do sewer, some do fire protection. Village districts have different multiple purposes. Um, now public purposes uh, is not necessarily the same as a public benefit. A general benefit, public benefit to the public still might count, uh, might not count, but it still could count. So I guess I'll give you an example, and I've gotten these questions many years. In the, my town of Bow, every year the select board sets aside some money to spend to appropriate to uh, local um, uh, welfare organizations. So they will appropriate a certain amount of money for the uh, Visiting Nurse Association mm -hmm. or for uh, the, uh, the provision of uh, health care through a local doctor's group to uh, elderly patients. That still can be a, pu a sufficient public purpose because, you know, one of the things you can always say when you're dealing with a social, social welfare organization, if these services are provided through the Visiting Nurse Association, you may help avoid someone becoming destitute, and a destitute person is a, someone you may have to help through local s assistance, local welfare. So there is a public benefit in those circumstances, but it does have to be generally a public purpose for the spending of public money. Um, you may, again, the idea here, as I've already expressed, the main purpose has to promote the public welfare um, and the obligations to benefit the municipality, but you do have to avoid um, situations where you're only benefiting a private person. And this is a common issue in some towns where, you know, over time, for whatever reason, the select board members might get their road plowed. And I always suspected that to be true, and I was told that's not true. The select board does not have their roads plowed. Or, you know, or you have, you know, there there's a number of situations I remember not too long ago in Concord where they really had to narrow their plowing budget, and they realized uh, through mistake or by accident over the years, they were plowing, plowing some private roads. And they had to let people know, wait a minute, this is a private road. We can't plow it anymore. We had to draw back their plowing budget to only public purposes. So um, that is an area that can sometimes come up. But I know the select board does not have the road plow. Um, <laughs> so uh, one of the things that you'll see when you talk about setting aside money for a specific purpose is how should warrant articles be worded. And we'll talk about this specifically, but one of the things you don't want to do, and I had a select one the other day, I, we were right in the middle of doing our local officials workshops, and we had a selectman uh, in Bethlehem who brought to our attention, you know, the town meeting voted in the year 2000 to raise and appropriate $10,000 for a capital reserve fund to buy a 2001 Chevy F10 with, you know, and it was just specified right down to the floorboards of what they were going to buy. But of course, at the time, they didn't have enough money, and they didn't put enough money in, and now it's 15 years later, and there's no 2001 Chevy F10 you can buy anywhere. <laughs> And that was just a, not a good idea. So, so the point is that you know you do have to be specific, but you also have to leave yourself some flexibility. And again, the same concept when you're saying when you've got a budget, don't zero something out. Leave a placeholder because you just never know what the flexibility you might need to allow the movement of dollars around as the select board can do. However, you do always have to say a state a specific amount. That is a necessary requirement for a legal appropriation. Um, so uh, for an appropriation to be legal, you have to have a public hearing. Uh, you have to disclose all purposes and amounts at the final public hearing. So when you're scheduled for your final public hearing for your municipal budget, all amounts have to be disclosed or discussed at the final public hearing. Now, theoretically, it's not a good idea per se, but it can happen that the, it, by necessity the select board has to show up at that hearing and saying we're changing this number. Mm -hmm. That's legal because it's discussed or disclosed at the final hearing. It doesn't have to be on the agenda noticed on the public hearing. Um, 
we also have to have gross based budgeting. The total amount is raised and appropriated in the budget. There has to be uh, recommendations placed on the on the warrant, especially in SB2 towns. The recommendations are somewhat are very important. I don't know how it's done in Hampton, but there are many towns have actually stipulated that their select board and their budget committee will state how the vote went. So it's you know five in favor, two against, or yeah, whatever the case may be. Uh, there has to be warrant notice. That is, there has to be a notice you know that the town meeting is going to meet on this day, and there has to be disclosure of the amounts that are going to be appropriated, and that's the posting of the budget, the signed budget, which is signed by the, the budget committee for adoption by the town meeting. Um, the, the public hearing process, typically you're taking place uh, in January, on or before the third Tuesday in January for a March SB2. Mm -hmm. So it's basically 25 days before a traditional town meeting. Again, it's held by the official budget committee at least seven days notice prior to the hearing. Mm -hmm. Um, as we discussed at the budget hearing, all amounts to be appropriated have to be discussed or disclosed. No new amounts or purposes can be added um, uh, after the public hearing, um, and the budget committee uh, uh, can take suggestions or they cannot take suggestions, but it all has to be dealt with at the final budget hearing. Um, after the close of the budget hearing, no purposes can be added. Uh, no increased amounts can be made. No new subject matter can be added to the budget. Now, that does not prevent the budget committee or the school board, I mean, the, the, the governing body of the school board, to reduce an amount in a, in a separate warrant article. And I've seen that happen more than once, where the school board says, okay, w well, A, in my town, the school board just decided at the last second, no, we're not going to do with that warrant article. They're going to take it off the warrant. They have that authority. Um, uh, I know there was some discussion um, in one town where what, what was it legal for the school board or the budget committee or school board or the governing body to take off the budget a warrant article and I'm afraid that's legal they didn't add anything they just took an article off they decided that it was not prudent to go forward with that proposed approach that wasn't a petition though. no it wasn't no. a petition article it was an article by the right. by yeah. the, uh, the it was the school board deciding not to put money in the capital reserve fund they just not decided to take it off the warrant um, Public hearing also applies to petition warrant articles. So if someone petitions a warrant article, um, that's something that the budget committee has to opine on and have a hearing on. By the way, I, I would just mention that one of the things that came up at my budget hearing a couple of years ago is, was it appropriate for the budget <coughs> committee to have a hearing on and give a recommendation on a non-money warrant article? And it was a tricky issue because I don't know if you're aware of this, but the school boards now have the authority to have um, uh, to retain funds. And it used to be the school board had to turn over all dollars they hadn't spent. They now have a statute that allows the school board to retain a certain amount of money, uh, just like a town has an unreserved sun, sun balance. The school boards can do the same thing. So we had an article on the warrant proposed. That, uh, that has to be approved by the town meeting. And the question was, should the budget committee give an opinion about that? And I said, no, we're not touching that because that is just not our job. Our job is only to give opinions on money articles, not, you know, issues. And that's a kind of a, could be a controversial political issue. Um, uh, the budget committee, as I said, finance, uh, finalizes the budget at the close of the public hearing, and this is done at a public meeting. And I, you know how you do it, but at, at all the, the town meetings that went on for the three town meetings and school district meeting was I was on the budget committee. I was only on for one term. At the end of our budget hearing, our final budget hearing, the town manager or the finance director for the town or the business manager for the school would walk over to East Budget Committee member and we would be signing the budget so that it could get all posted on time. So we typically dealt with it at the final budget hearing. Um, so you have to post the budget at least 14 days before the meeting. I think that's slightly different for SB2. Um, and the forwarding of the budget from the budget committee to the school board at least 20 days before the meeting. Again, we typically signed it after the end of the public hearing uh, in the town that I was in. Um, Again, posting of the warrant and budget, traditional 14 days for the meeting, include all appropriations. And this is important, DRA will, DRA will invalidate any mm -hmm. not listed appropriation. Yeah. Um, so a few examples of gross basis budgeting. This is an example where the town's going to raise an appropriate $25,000 to replace a wooden play structure at the playground. The total replacement cost is $35,000, but $5,000 will be withdrawn from the playground capital reserve fund. 
and the selectman have received a commitment for a donation for the remaining $5,000. The problem with this is no gross amount appropriated. It really should have said the city of the town raised an appropriate $35,000. And that's the, the real solution to articles like this. You can have multiple sources of the dollars, but you still have to state the bottom line total amount of the appropriation. Um, again, gross basis budgeting, and this is the example I gave you before to see if the town are raised and appropriate the 215 Ford F2 4x4 truck with friendly Ford sales in Florida, New Hampshire. <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's just going to be a problem if they don't have them. You know, what are you going to do? So you really just have to say to see if the town raise and appropriate. And by the way, there's no specific dollar amount there either. So you should have said to see if the town would raise and appropriate $35,000 to buy a pickup truck or a dump truck for the Public Works Department uh, without specifying the source of the vendor, et cetera. Um, another example to see if the town will create the position of the athletic director to coordinate the activities of youth athletic leagues. This is a part-time voluntary position. Now, someone moves at the town meeting, this is a part-time position with a salary of $20,000, which amount is hereby raised and appropriated? Well, the problem is the first warrant article was fine, but what happened is that on the floor of the town meeting, they put in money which was not noticed to the public. Yeah. You can't add dollars that weren't there before. You can increase or decrease the amount, but you can't just all of a sudden turn an article with no money in it and say we're going to now raise money through that warrant article. So DRA would disallow the failure to give notice of that proposed appropriation. Um, frankly, if they'd left it alone, the select boards, I suppose, could have found a place to fund it. So the, the evil of this particular one was failure to appropriate a sum certain. Um, so gross, gross based budgeting, again, continuing on that subject, there are such things as special warrant articles, which are defined by 32.3. Special warrant articles are petitioned appropriations, bond issues, monies into or out of, into or out of capital reserve, it's designated as special non-lapsing, and recommendation is required. I think the key thing to keep in mind with um, special warrant articles is that they have specific period of times that they lapse. And one key uh, thing to keep in mind is that a special warrant article will not lapse, uh, uh, will lapse in the fiscal year it's appropriated unless the select board votes to encumber the money for an additional one year before the end of the fiscal year. So I had a call from a town the other day where they said, oh, we did raise an appropriate uh, a, a by separate warrant article, a special warrant article, the money to do an energy audit for our town. And they said, do you think we could spend the money this year? And I said, well, that was 2014. Did the select board vote to encumber the funds before the end of your fiscal year? What was the end of your fiscal year? Oh, it was December of 2014. Well, did they vote to do that? No, but can they do that now? No, you can't do that now. You have to vote to encumber before the end of the fiscal year. And Steve, can I just add with the, um, the, I think the other big thing about special articles, not to be confused with separate articles. You, there can be things that are voted on separately from the operating budget, but just because it's voted on separately doesn't mean it's one of these special articles. And the other thing I think that's important about special articles is that any money that is appropriated under any one of these special articles cannot be transferred to another purpose. So you can't transfer out of any article that is a special article. So if you had a petitioned article for $20,000 to do something and the voters approved it, and that project was going to cost $21,000, the selectman can transfer $1,000 in. But if that project comes out costing $19,000, they can't transfer that other $1,000 out. So that's the two pieces of that so special article is that um, it may not lapse. Uh, it, it can be carried over. It's one of those exceptions to the lapse rule. But the other thing is that it kind of locks it in. It can't be used for any other purpose. So I've already talked about recommendations. You know, this, the Budget Committee has to give a recommendation on se special warrant articles. And as I mentioned, uh, many towns have adopted a provision where uh, a numeric tally is required to show how the vote went. Uh, it is necessary for all separate and spe special and separate appropriation articles. Uh, and typically you'll see, you know, that the, the Budget Committee recommends the article, uh, et cetera, uh, by uh, a vote, et cetera, of 9 to 2 or 3 to 2 for the select board, as the case may be. So let's talk about the Budget Committee. Um, as we said, the Budget Committee is a, 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 can be officially established under 3214. Um, 
if it's elected, uh, that's an elected position. I was an elected budget committee member, and I won by the skin of my chinny chin chin. Uh, and I noticed that that the only people who won stood at the polls all day with the signs, because that's the only way you're going to prevail. And I beat the person who didn't stand there all day. So <laughs> one election uh, lesson I learned: you got to stand there all day. Um, that the, uh, advisory budget committees. Um, it can be typically appointed by the select board or they can be elected. 10% um, limitation does not apply for an advisory committee. Uh, and the governing body's budget is posted instead of the budget committees if you've got an advisory budget committee. Um, now, the budget committee's job is to review current year's expenditures, review the proposal of the governing body, prepare the budget, schedule and hold the budget hearings, and fo forward final proposed budget to the governing body for posting with the warrant. Now, I'm aware that, you know, there are some questions about how does the budget committee here in Hampton um, gather information for your decision making about when you're uh, at the time that your budget is going to be proposed. You know, again, I all I would comment is, you know, I, it seems to me, um, you know, the town is pretty much just recently adopted a budget. Um, you certainly have the right, um, and we'll get into this, that the Budget Committee can ask that department heads come meet with you and discuss what's going on with the departments. But it seems to me, uh, again, from my experience, you know, the departments are just beginning to spend or ha are spending the dollars. They're about halfway through the fiscal year or your calendar year. And you really won't know the, the real lay of the land with regards to what's going to happen with the town's budget until, you know, they are asked. Because it really, you really should, I, my, my recommendation is wait for the process to take place. And again, typically you're going to be seeing the administration sometime in July or August send a memo to all the department heads saying, I want your budgets for the 2016 mm -hmm. fiscal year on my desk by, August 15th, and, and that's when the, the, the budget committee, the town department had to put their budgets together, and they're not even going to be thinking about their budgets until then, so if you ask a town department head to come in to see you in June, I mean, they're, they're not, that's just not on their radar screen, but when it is on their radar screen, you know, it makes sense, and, and it seems to me it's either at or about the time they submit their um, budget proposal to the town manager. Now, one thing I would say about the process we had in Bo, which I think worked out very well. The, the selectmen knew that the sooner the budget committee was knowledgeable about what was going on in the budget in Bo, the better. And so what the select board did every year, they had a system set up so that in usually at the end of September, they had two back-to-back -back Saturdays where every department would come in and explain their proposed budget. And they would, we would, you know, we, the fire department would come in, the police department, and they would all take an hour to go over their budget. And although this was intended to inform the select board on what budget they might eventually propose to the budget committee, the the select board realized, well, it's better for the select the budget committee to be there when we're meeting with the department heads, so they can gather the same information we're gathering, so that when they get the budget, they'll even be better informed. So that worked out great for us. Uh, and I, again, I don't know how they do it in Hampton, but it uh, seems to me, you know, that's what you should be thinking about in terms of when it, it makes sense for the, the budget committee to be involved in the budget process. Um, now, you will, will eventually review a budget proposal from the governing body. You will prepare a budget. I, honestly, I, I don't, I guess, when it says you prepare a budget, you know, you get this huge budget book with all these lines. I mean, I don't, I'm not sitting down with a separate set of Excel spreadsheets creating my own budget. I'm, I'm getting it from the finance director in this huge budget book, and I'm basically going through their book. Now, if you have the wherewithal to do your own Excel spreadsheets, you know, I, I suppose, but typically you're going to be working off their information sheets, and you're going to be digesting it to make a judgment as to whether or not you agree with all those numbers. That doesn't mean you couldn't suggest that it's an appropriate situation that if you see that the, there's a line item in the budget to have um, uh, eight recreation aides in the recreation department and you really think there should be ten, well, you can say, we think there ought to be ten. Or for that matter, if you think the police department's buying too many bullets, you can say, you know, cut, <laughs> cut down their budget on bullets. Or my big thing when I was on the budget committee was overtime. It was driving me crazy. The overtime budget, in the, in the, especially in the dispatch office, drove me absolutely loony. 
And I kept saying to the town manager, we need to have a different system so we don't have so much overtime. Why can't we have staff it up so we have people who are going to work full time rather than have a bunch of part timers who have huge amounts of overtime? But no one really listened to me. <laughs> and not on the budget committee anymore. So uh, the municipal officials, administrative officials prepare statements of estimated expenditures and they're submitted at such times and in such details the governing body may require. That's kind of the process. Um, the budget committee reviews those statements submitted to them um, and they can submit their own recommendations to the budget at such time as the department heads the budget committee fixes. And they can also ask the department heads, um, you know, to come in and speak to them about estimated expenditures. And I would also agree it also makes sense to hear to, from the assessor. What's going on in the assessment systems? Where, where are the numbers? Where do you stand in terms of, you know, how many uh, applications for abatements have you got? How many, you know, how many appeals? How much is in your overlay? You know, all those other things that go into what's going on in the dollars and cents on, in the real estate market. That's, those are legitimate inquiries. I don't think it's an unfair inquiry to have. Um, the governing body may, as you know, um, transfer dollars from appropriations from an unexpended balance to some other appropriation, and the bud they have to keep record of those uh, transfers um, so that people can make sure the transfers are for a purpose which are appropriate. And uh, but ultimately, the budget committee really can't challenge those appropriation transfers. Uh, now, you could, you know, if. You know, one of the challenges that could occur, and I've seen this before, where a trustee's a trust fund is asked to transfer money from a capital reserve fund to the budget committee or to the, the selectman for a purpose that's not allowed, and the trustee is going to say, wait a minute, how are you asking for me to transfer money for uh, from the fire department capital reserve fund to spend money on a police car? So there would be appropriate judgments by the trustees of trust funds, and that certainly could be something raised by the budget committee. But in the, ultimately, the decision to say, we're going to spend less on recreation this year. I'm going to put more into the plowing budget. That's up to the select board. That's just one of the ex exigencies that have to be handled when you're operating with the budget, a municipal budget, uh, during the fiscal year. Um, as I said, the authority of the budget committee is to prepare the budget under 32.5. You can confer. Uh, and I will emphasize it is true. Um, it shall be the duty of all such officers and persons to furnish pertinent information to the budget committee. But at the same time, the only thing I would also offer, because I know there's some discussion of this issue here in Hampton, that you know you have to do it with an understanding that the town still has to operate, and so there has to be some, you know, manner of transfer of information so that it doesn't interrupt the ordinary affairs of the municipal organization, but also fulfills the purpose that you have to investigate and understand what does the budget look like and what will it look like in the succeeding fiscal year. Um, as again, you, you conduct the public hearings and you final you forward your final copies of the budgets to the town clerk. Um, so the most important power the budget committee has to limit appropriations not by more than 10 percent of the total amount recommended by the budget committee. Now, one of the things, and there's a case on this I want to point out that a budget committee cannot do because there's a budget committee in Hudson that tried this one year. They automatically reduce the budget by 10 percent below. Uh, the previous year's budget, specifically for the purpose of preventing from people raising it by 10 percent. So they cut it by 10 percent automatically after the amount they had already had a discussion. We will agree to this budget. And then they said, okay, now we're going to take that budget, we're going to reduce it by 10 percent. And there's actually a case that says a budget committee cannot do that. That's improper. Now that there was a budget committee, and I don't know what town it was in recently, where there was an argument about that budget committee doing that. I want to say it was Sandborn, uh, Sand, Sandown, maybe. No. Uh, was that? No, no. Sandown, where the, and there was a case on it, and and the Sandown budget committee was found to have acted consistent with the law, not contrary to this one case. And I, I would love to be able to recite the particulars to you. But if in your inquiry you send me a request for that case, I'd be happy to send it to you. Because it does help better understand what is the authority of the Budget Committee and what they can and cannot do with regards to you know, that 10 percent limitation. Um, so what else goes on the ballot? Uh, only things that are required, nothing extra. The actual questions and recommendations. There is a provision now where you can uh, put a tax rate impact if that's been adopted by the legislative body. 
Understand that if the legislative body says we want a tax rate impact put on each one article, um, <coughs> the amount of the estimate is by the governing body, not by the budget committee. So that number, which could be debated, and I've seen it at a town meeting where someone says, wait a minute, that, that estimated tax rate, that's incorrect. It's somebody who's an accountant who's in the, um, in the, in the meeting and they say that number's <laughs> wrong. And, and the, 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 you could li politely listen to them, but the bottom line is the moderator should say, "Well, that's interesting, but it's the budget, it's the select board's job to decide what's going to be on the tax rate impact, the number." Um, finally, the, the warrant notice is another key concept. Uh, you can't have a valid appropriation without notice in the warrant of what's going to be appropriated. Uh, the appropriations only valid if it appears in the warrant. Um, you can't add new purposes or light items from the floor of the town meeting. So if you don't have um, a, uh, a line item for books in your <laughs> budget, you can't add it on the floor of the town meeting. But if you had a line item for $10, you know, you could add it. But you would ultimately, with a budget, you add it to the bottom line, not to the specific line. Um, <coughs> voters may amend from the floor, both in traditional and deliberative session, although the ability to amend from the floor in an SB2 town is somewhat limited. Now, you, you can't eliminate the subject matter of, a, of an article, mm -hmm. uh, and there's some debate of what does eliminate the subject matter mean. Our position is it basically means you can't take an article that says that see if the town would raise an appropriate $10,000 for a new playground equipment and just change it to to see. Yeah, that's just taking the subject away. Um, the, the proposed budget is ultimately advisory only in terms of all of its line. It's the bottom line that counts. Um, the voters cannot later restrict transfers. The transfer authority remains with the governing body. Um, the, you can generally alter the mode of funding, although uh, if you, with a capital reserve fund, um, DRA will not let you name agents to expend from the floor of the town meeting. So if you have a warrant article that says, see if the town will create a, a fire truck capital reserve fund and put $100,000 into it, someone can't add at the floor of the town meeting and to name the select board as agents to expend. They will disallow that. Um, and uh, you you can't appropriation to capital reserve amended to accomplish a purpose during that fiscal year. They're going to say they, they will take the position that that's an appropriation should be a separate article to appropriate funds. So they can't, you can't change an appropriation that's going to capital reserve and say instead. So if there was an article to see if the town would raise an appropriate hundred thousand dollars <coughs> to put it into the fire truck capital reserve fund, you can't change that to to see if the town would just spend hundred thousand dollars for a new fire truck, because that's changing a warrant article from saving to spending, and that would also be disallowed. And the other thing that we always talk about on warrant notice is the state home rule. If if Martha Aunt Martha would have changed her mind about the fact that you're going to spend money buying a, a pickup truck rather than the backhoe that she thinks you really need to fit the culvert in front of her, her house, that would be a state home rule. She would have showed up to vote for the, the, the backhoe, but you've changed it now to a pickup truck, and that's kind of the stay at home rule. Um, <clears throat> in a traditional meeting, voters can actually table an article. They can say, we're going to pass over that. We're not going to address it. You can't do that, SB2. All articles that are on the warrant must be put to the ballot for voting. You can't, under SB2, like I said, eliminate the subject matter um, and make it a nullity. You can freely amend the dollar amounts up and down within the 10% limitation. On the bottom line. On the bottom line. Thank you. Uh, and there's no spending without an appropriation, another key concept. You can't spend any money uh, unless there's been appropriated for that purpose, which requires a town or district vote. Uh, it could include non-tax revenue, such as you know money that comes in, although it's tax money, uh, from the uh, uh, annual uh, highway uh, block grant. There are exceptions to the no spending without an appropriation rule. Um, legal judgments, <laughs> it'd be nice to think, well, okay, we're not going to pay that $100,000 judgment, which we're not going to appropriate the money. Well, uh, the, uh, the courts in the legislature figured that one out a long time ago. That will work. Uh, you're going to have to pay that judgment. Uh, you can get DRA permission to overspend uh, the bottom line, and that's particularly can occur, it can happen with a number of towns. In 2006, with the Mother's Day flood, where the towns had to actually 
get permission from DRA to spend for emergency purposes. Uh, you might have a prior mandate from a federal or state government. Um, and uh, there is the ability to transfer dollars within um, an appropriation. So you can transfer funds from the rec department to the plowing budget. Um, obviously, for a town that has a fiscal, uh, a calendar year budget, you don't adopt your budget until March, and so you're spending from January to March dollars that are technically not appropriate. The statute recognizes that, but those dollars that are spent between January 1st and the date of appropriation have to be reasonable in terms of what was spent last year for the same amounts. But technically, you are spending without an appropriation. And Congress does it all the time, so whatever. <laughs> um, uh, so there's more exceptions. You can have unanticipated revenue. So this is, you know, a bond, a, 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 a private uh, grant or a state grant, 3195B. You can have dollars spent without an appropriation. Capital reserve and trust funds are also spending without technically an appropriation, but those were previously appropriated dollars. Town meeting 10 years ago said we're going to spend money on the S on the uh, Chevy F10 truck, uh, and you can spend those dollars later on if you can find one. Um, there are other funds that are out there that where dollars are spent. Not uncommon for a town to have a conservation fund where dollars are uh, allocated from your land use change tax, and so dollars are spent by the Conservation Commission to buy land or easements with the select board's approval. You have sewer water reserves that are separate spending accounts. And some towns have revolving funds. In my town, we have a revolving fund for recreation fees. And that was one of the other things I was always pushing for. Let's get the rec department totally self-funded so that it's all funded by uh, ex the fees people pay for classes. We're not there yet. We're almost at 85%, but it would be nice to be 100%. Um, so as we've said, if you're out of money, now what? Again, we can transfer dollars. Um, you can appropriate dollars if you accept and expend anticipated funds. You can ask for DRA permission to overspend the budget. You can go to special town meeting. I have petitioned on two separate occasions for permission to hold a special town meeting to raise and appropriate money. Um, I have gotten every one of those petitions granted. Um, but it's a lot different today than it was back in the 1990s. I think it would be very difficult, given the way the statute is worded, to show that you really have a true emergency that requires special town meeting. But you can do it. 31 colon 5, 30, 5 sets about the process, and you have to find a Superior Court judge who agrees with you. Um, so there are other ways in which you can have spending without an appropriation. Technically, when you have uh, collective bargaining agreement, it's really not a spending without an appropriation. It's a spending where, under this, and the concept is, and this comes from a, a case called the Appeal of Town of Sanborn, you Sanborn Sanbornize a contract. That is, the collective bargaining agreement says that the cost items for this, for this collective bargaining agreement, usually it's a three-year agreement, is X for year one, X for year two, and Y for year three. Um, as long as you disclose to the legislative body the full fiscal impact of a multi-year contract, you can sanbornize, this is the term of art we use, the, the agreement, and the town meeting can bind a future town meeting. <coughs> town meetings normally can't do that, but the Supreme Court has made clear in this case, yes, it can do it. You can have multi-year agreements uh, for equipments. You buy equipment with an escape clause, and if you don't appropriate the money in the future, you turn the equipment back which, by the way, I have never seen happen. I don't know who is going to turn back a partially used fire truck, but <laughs> theoretically you can have that, and you can have other multi-year contracts. Now, one that's come up a lot, which I haven't figured out the answer to, there's a lot of um, uh, energy companies are going to town saying, we want to sell you on a long-term contract a certain amount of electricity at a set price. And the problem we face is that I can't sanbornize that contract. And the reason why is I can certainly agree to buy electricity at a set price, but I can't disclose to the taxpayers the financial impact of that because we don't know how much electricity the town of Hampton or Bow is going to need in two or three years. And in order to figure out how much money they're going to spend, you not only need the rate, you need the amount of electricity. So it's hard to make that 
full disclosure that's required under the Sanborn licensing, Sanbornization of a contract. So uh, those, I think you're going to be more and more are going to be induced or, or lured or whatever you want to say into trying to get into multi-year agreements. Uh, and, and particularly in the energy sector, it's going to be more common. And uh, it may be that there, be a, there might be a need for legislative changes to allow towns to exercise those kind of options. Um, so uh, lapse of appropriations, all appropriations lapse at the end of the year. Uh, unspent money goes into the fund balance. It must be appropriated again, or it can be used to reduce the following year's tax rate, or it's retained for emergencies. Um, the fund balance is made up of unexpended appropriations, excess revenues, uncollected taxes, and liabilities. Uh, DRA recommends a retained fund balance of 5 to 15 percent or 8 to 17 percent of general fund operating expenditures. Um, again, back to the lapse of appropriations, uh, encumbered funds um, uh, will lapse depending upon the time period that the board might select. One thing I would say about bonds, once you raise an appropriate money by bond and indebtedness, that's a permanent potential encumbrance. That is, you've agreed to see if the town raise and appropriate $10 million for the construction of a wastewater treatment system. That goes on forever as an ability of the, of the governing body to spend those dollars. But you can dial that back with a subsequent article to either cut back the amount approved or rescind the bond appro uh, approval that the town meeting granted. Um, capital reserve funds go on. Uh, as long as the capital reserve is remains or is not re uh, rescinded by the town meeting. You can have trust funds which are created for expendable purposes. Many towns have expendable trust funds they've used for spending for such things as health insurance. You can have, like I said, we've talked about special revenue funds. There's one in particular not mentioned here. There's a special revenue fund also used for recreation, same idea where the dollars that flow in from class uh, fees are used to fund the recreation department. Uh, there are other, as we've already mentioned, these uh, non-lapsing funds, conservation, sewer, water fund. Impact fees are also an off-budget item. So if you have an impact fee system, we are charging developers their fair share cost of uh, improvements to capital infrastructure caused by their particular project. You could have an impact fee, and we've already talked about the Recreation Revolving Fund. Um, we talked about the transfer of appropriations by the town meeting. You can't do it out of special warrant articles. You have to keep a record of those transfers. You still can't overexpend the bottom line. Um, this that case recently came up that is worthy of reading by budget committee members that it affirms the uh, governing body's unfettered authority to transfer. And I see it does involve the town of Hampton. Right there. <laughs> there it is. So there, your town is right there in black and white in our PowerPoint. Um, uh, now, there is a, a transfer appropriations. You can have a situation where uh, the voters decide to say an article not adopted, this is true, uh, a failed separate water article, mean, no means no. And I had this question, one of the first questions I had, I gotta speed up a little bit, Barbara, no, I'm sorry. Uh, one okay. of the first questions I had when I came to the legal advisory service, they called up and then they said, well, the town had a separate warrant article to see if the town raised an appropriate 10,000, uh, it's actually it was $25,000 to install new IT infrastructure in the town. I said, okay, what happened? It was defeated. And I said, well, you can't spend any money for IT infrastructure during the following fiscal year, because that's the net effect of that being defeated. And then next, the next uh, statement was, well, but the town administrator just went out to Staples and bought a, a router. And I said, <laughs> okay. We're, and then I said, well, is there another place in the budget where that could be placed? Well, not really. And was this intended to be part of the infrastructure that was going to be built to enhance your IT infrastructure? Yes. And she just went and bought it anyway. I said, okay, well, I don't, I just said, no, nope, that's not good. So that's, that's a problem. And that's the kind of thing that this can create. And, and, it, and it does, it is an issue. But there are a number of towns that are very leery about putting articles on the warrant, separate warrant articles, mm -hmm. because they know, well, okay, I want to get it passed, but what if it gets defeated? Yeah. I can't spend money for that purpose. So it does create some inhibition on governing bodies to put certain things in separate warrant articles. Um, and, and you can zero out a line in your budget. 
I've just never seen it, you know, because I think what we're talking about is zeroing out a line item. You're talking about zeroing out a whole department. Now, could you imagine if someone, you know, the town meeting said we're going to zero out the line item for the police department? Uh, it, it would be chaotic. Um, so I've never seen it, but um, I think the biggest impact I've seen is with these separate warrant articles that get defeated. That's really where no mean no has real impact. Um, so finally, just again reminding you about the budget cycle. Um, you have the preparation of the, the budget, presentation to the Board of Selectmen and the Budget Committee. It goes to the town meeting, presentation of voters, adoption of the budget, and then you have the monitoring of revenues, expenditures, and events and experiences. So that's the entire circle of life here in the never financial. <laughs> it never stops. <laughs> Although I think summer typically could be a quieter time for those budget committees. So I'm going to let Barbara take over the next yeah. right. step, and financing. I just, I just had a, um, I have to give the, the a no means no example because it's the one that I always use to say, you, you think it's very clear, no means no. No appropriation, don't spend the money. And there, there was a town that had um, on their warrant, they had a warrant article to do, to build a, some type of a senior center, a community center. It was about a million dollars. Brought it to the voters. Um, they were going to bond it. It got turned down. Okay? No means no. You can't spend the money. That town had a very generous benefactor in town who donated a million dollars to build that senior center. So now the question is they have a million dollar donation, but they have a no means no situation, and they don't really know. Why did the voters turn it down? Did they not want to bond it? Did they not like the location? Did they not want a senior center? Did they want an all-purpose center? You don't know why they voted no. So they couldn't um, spend that money. They could accept the donation, but they could not spend that money until the following year. Now, when they finally did, were able to um, ap appropriate that money, accept that money, and started building the senior center, um, it had an event of arson as the senior center got built. So clearly, somebody really meant no in that town. They did not want that senior center in that town. So I just always have to share that. That was the town of Hopkinton. That was the Hop Hopkinton, a town yes. uh, yeah, yeah. which is right near me, and they were struggling with a very high tax rate right now. Yeah. So um, I wanted to just... Hopkinton. 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 Yeah. Other side of Concord. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about the financing options. So once... Once the budget is prepared, where do you get the money? Now, Steve has talked about some of these things, but I just want to go over uh, in a little bit more detail some of these so you understand sort of the, the background and the philosophy on these. Probably in your town in Hampton, I'm sure you've got lots of capital reserve funds, expendable trust funds, you've been bonding, you're doing all of these things. But just to have a little bit more background, what is the philosophy on the different ways to finance the budget that you're putting together. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with these. I did want to talk to you about state aid um, and where we are with the state budget up to date. I was at the legislature until 2.30 today finding out exactly what the Senate was doing in terms of uh, revenues coming to cities and towns. So I wanted to cover a little bit of that with you because that obviously is going to affect you for the next two years as the state's um, developing their budget. And then um, the last thing I wanted to cover is a, a little bit about the property tax, the, the rate setting process as Steve said, and more importantly, that piece about how do you estimate how much something is going to cost on your budget, whether that's an increase or a decrease in revenue or an increase in appropriation or a decrease in appropriation. Some of you may know how to figure out that estimate. How much would $500,000 appropriation be on your tax rate? How much would $25,000 be? Some of you may know how to do that. I'm assuming not all of you know how to do it, but when you leave here tonight, you will know how to estimate that. And um, I've been told by quite a few people that um, that was the most handy tool to have in my presentation, and that's why I keep it until the end. <laughs> so so um, with that said, um, we've already talked a little bit, Steve's already talked a little bit about the re the, um, the reserve funds. And as he said, these are savings accounts. 
The, the difference between these is that the expendable trust is really in, intended to be for sort of maintenance type of areas, whereas the capital reserve funds are for kind of specific capital improvements. Now, I can tell you that in those years when I was back at the Department of Revenue Administration, this was an area that a lot of municipalities had disallowances because they named it the wrong thing. They wanted to set something up, you know, to, to provide, you know, to raise and appropriate ten thousand dollars for the maintenance of the town hall, but they would call it the town the, the town hall maintenance capital reserve fund. They it was it, it just was going into the wrong category, or it was a capital expenditure that they put in an expendable trust. And they had they were disallowing so many of these appropriations. Finally we said, you know what? Let's just go get the law changed to say that the same rules apply regardless of what you're calling it. So when you look at the rules for capital reserve funds, um, it'll refer back to the expendable trust funds. So how do you set these up? How do you um, get rid of them when there's, they're no longer needed? What if you set one up and you ha it, the purpose is no longer? You don't need that Ford F-150 <laughs> from 2001, but you've got $15,000 in that account. How do you get rid of it? Um, the rules still apply. It's the same thing. So basically, these are your savings accounts. And obviously, these are for sort of uh, at least the capital reserve fund. It's kind of for the big ticket items. And probably you're doing these for some of, some of those um, projects on your capital improvements program that you you know you're, you're going to have to fund these things uh, sometime in the near future. So really it is. These are your savings accounts for doing those things. The expendable trusts, um, really good to set up for things like um, those unexpected increases in health insurance, for example. So you could have an expendable trust for um, health insurance increases or, you know, some other um, insurance inc increases or, you know, plowing expenses because we may have another winter like we just had, those kinds of things. Um, lease agreements. So um, municipalities can enter into lease agreements. The big thing here is, uh, and I think Steve did allude to this, is whether you whether you can get out of the agreement or not. You can certainly lease something for multiple years, so you could have a five-year lease to lease a piece of equipment. But it's that fine print in that lease agreement that is going to dictate whether it's going to need just a majority vote or a supermajority two-thirds vote. If you can get out of the lease then it's just going to require a majority vote because you're not binding a future town meeting. If you can't really get out of that lease and you're locked into it for five years, then it is viewed as if it is debt. You're really signing an agreement and you're binding future town meetings to, uh, to appropriate the money for that lease for, the ne for not just this year, but for the going into the future. So it's going to need a super majority. And I think where I've heard some of the, the issues is that some of the vendors, because obviously the vendors are interested in having it as easy as possible to get these approved, so they will attempt to write the lease so that it appears that it's only a majority vote needed. But again, when you read that fine print, not only does it say you have to give back that fire truck if you don't appropriate the money, but it then says, and you can't buy a similar piece of equipment for the next five years. So, you know, they kind of lock you in with that. So you, you got to look at that fine print. But certainly um, looking at some of your big equipment items like that, leases are, uh, you know, one of the financing tools that you can use. Um, from the bonding standpoint, um, and again, you've, you've issued bonds before. Basically what you're doing, it's, it's just like a mortgage. You're, you're um, borrowing money and you're promising who's ever um, investing in your bonds that you are going to pay those, that money back over uh, a period of time. Usually you're doing these bonding projects. They're usually expensive. They're, a lot of times it's for your infrastructure is when you're going to use the, the bond financing, long-term paybacks, you know, t 20 to 30 years. There's um, generally two, two types of bonds. One is called general obligation bonds, and this is where the full faith and credit of the municipality is backing those bonds, okay? The revenue bonds, we see this occasionally. Um, there's a certain revenue stream 
that is backing the bond. So it's not the full faith and credit of the town, but a specific revenue stream. So a parking garage is an example. City of Manchester built a very expensive parking garage, but it was going to be those parking fees that were going to pay back the bond that they uh, took out to build that parking garage. So um, in most cases, probably most of your bonds, I would imagine, are general obligation bonds. With the bonding, there's a separate chapter. It's RSA Chapter 33. You, the most important thing is you have to dot every I and cross every T and follow that law to a T. And as Steve indicated, DRA can disallow it, but long before DRA would get around to disallowing a bond article because you didn't dot your I's and cross your T's, you, would, you will not be able to get bond council approval to issue those bonds. So more important than DRA is bond council. So you do have to um, follow um, exactly what the law says. Um, the interesting part of the bond issue is if you do it right, you dot your I's, you cross your T's, you bring it to town meeting, and they approve it, um, you're going to have a series of payments, debt service payments, that you're going to have to pay back over a certain number of years, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. If a future town meeting neglects or refuses to appropriate that money to pay back that debt service, there's a statute that says DRA can insert that payment and cause you to raise it in your tax rate. That is one of the rare occasions where a non-appropriated amount is going to be included in your tax rate whether or not the voters um, approve that. The reason being is we as a state cannot have a municipality default on a bond payment. One municipality defaulting on a bond, pay on a bond payment would have ramifications for the entire state uh, including the state of New Hampshire's bond rating and everyone else's. So there are protections in the law to make sure that every municipality, every school district, every county, the state of New Hampshire that issue bonds will honor those obligations to their investors because there's just too much at stake if, if there's a default. Um, so that is one of, that's called one of those mandatory assessments. And again, credit rating implications. Um, Obviously, you know, with a default, we would ha certainly have those credit rating um, in impacts. Um, for the bonds, again, Chapter 33 is um, kind of pretty specific as, as to what you can use it for. And again, as I said, it's pretty much for those high-cost infrastructure, capital improvement type things. One thing the law does say is that you are prohibited from issuing bonds to cover current maintenance and operation costs unless otherwise authorized by law. So basically what that's saying is you can't put your grocery bill on your credit card. That's what it's saying. You can't put your monthly mortgage on your credit card. You can take out the mortgage and you've got to pay it back, but then you can't put that on your credit card is what it's saying. Now, I can tell you um, there have been a couple of exceptions to that where um, there were municipalities that got themselves into, or at least one, that got themselves into a situation where they were in a facing a significant, um, a s significant deficit because of an embezzlement, a very significant deficit because of an embezzlement and mismanagement of town funds by the town manager. And they were in such a deficit that they, they could not raise that money enough in one year to get them out of it. And they had to go to the legislature and ask permission to borrow money, pay it back over a five-year period to get them back on track. Okay, so that's why it says unless otherwise authorized by law. So there could be some exceptions, but generally you can't be you can't be bonding your operating costs. You would not want to do that anyway, right? Um, but in terms of the philosophy behind doing doing bonding, and I know there was one town which I was so surprised. <laughs> You know, it was a few years ago. They said, oh, we never bond. We don't believe in bonding. We just pay for everything right up front. I thought, well, that, you know, that sounds really good not to have any debt. But the whole purpose of bonding, again, because it's, it's these assets that you are expecting to last a really long time. So it's not something that you're going to just use in two or three or four years. These are assets like your water system, your sewer system, your, your, your new building, whatever. You expect it to be here 10, 15, or 20 years. So part of what you're doing is that you're, you're structuring the payments 
for this over the life of the asset so that you're not taxing just today's taxpayers for an asset that is going to benefit the citizens 10 years or 15 or 20 years from now. So certainly if you were to just try to, you know, just put it all in the tax rate right now, that would be huge sticker shock for some of these. But if you're spreading those payments out, it's referred to as intergenerational tax equity. So you're, you're kind of spreading that out. So you're saying, yes, this fire truck is going to benefit us for 10 years. There's no reason today's taxpayers have to pay for the whole thing. And um, usually when you're doing these large capital projects, it's not just one or the other type of financing. Often you'll be putting money in the capital reserve fund to help lower lower the cost of, it, of the, the item or the project. You may be combining it with um, bonding. There may be a grant. And that's where we get into that, that gross basis of accounting, uh, uh, gross basis budgeting in terms of putting the Warren article. So you will often see that it's a large, costly project, but you've got money in a reserve fund. Maybe you have some grant money that's available, and then you've got some bonding. Uh, so it's, it can be multiple financing options for that. Um, there is a limit, um, again, part of that, those statutes that help protect uh, municipalities, protect the state, there's a debt limit. Uh, it's 3% of your equalized property value that's determined by DRA that's on their website. You're probably nowhere close to it. I wouldn't imagine that you would be close to your debt limit, but it's just good to know that there is a, a limit out there. Many municipalities have their own um, policy in place that sets something more restrictive. They, you can certainly have a policy, excuse me, more restrictive than what the statute requires. Uh, for example, Dover is 65% of whatever the state limit is. So they, they are being more conservative. Um, Concord has an, another policy. I don't know if, um, if Hampton has your own debt, debt policy or not, um, but that is an uh, option that the, uh, usually in, um, it's adopted by the governing body um, in terms of when do, you, when do you expect projects to be financed through bonds? When do you expect projects to be financed maybe solely through those savings accounts? When do you expect it to be part of the operating budget? And some um, municipalities have different thresholds to give department heads ideas, uh, you know, kind of direction as to what is expected and have some consistency. Okay? Um, and then certainly, you know, where do you, where do you go to issue these bonds? Um, some municipalities, they issue the bonds directly to Wall Street. You know, usually most of the larger communities do that. Um, most communities will go through the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank, which takes all those bond issues that have been approved, for example, in March meeting by schools and towns and village districts. They kind of package it all together, and then they go sell those bonds from the bond bank uh, down on Wall Street. So it, it saves you a lot of costs and a lot of um, terms of uh, attorney fees and all those kinds of things by going through the municipal bond bank. So that's probably where you're going for smaller projects. You can certainly go to your local banks. You'll, um, chapter 33 refers to bonds or notes. So if you had a project that you wanted to pay off over three years, maybe it's a you know $4 million project and you may just, you know, your local bank may say, hey, you know, we'll finance that for you through a note. So that's another option. For water and sewer projects, there is the state revolving loan fund through the Department of Environmental Services, which um, has some very favorable interest rates for municipalities. So often um, that's where most of that financing can go through. Um, in terms of user fees, I wanted to uh, give you a couple of comments on user fees. I'm assuming that you have um, a number of fees in towns. Most municipalities do have a number of fees that they charge for a lot of different things. When you're looking at when you're looking at user fees, the, the kind of the two spectrums are the two ends of the spectrum are whether um, it's a specific service or it's a public service. So the, the kind of the two ends that I use, for example, are water and sur water and sewer is very specific, and usually in those cases. You know, the people that are receiving the water or, you know, the water or sewer services, they're paying those water sewer fees. It's covering the full cost of those operations. Whereas a service such as police and fire, that's a public benefit. It's not something that you're going to charge 
a user fee for. So that's sort of the, the two spec, you know, the, the two ends of the spectrum. But there's a lot of things in, in between. And I think, what was the one you were talking about? Oh, your recreation fees. Recreation, right? recreation fees. fees could certainly fall in, uh, in between. The most important thing is, as I think the very first slide that Steve showed said, we're not a home rule state. So the first thing you have to do when, you, when there's any fees being considered is you have to say, is there a statute that says we can charge this fee? Because you can't just decide to charge any fee just because the, the town wants to charge a fee. So on this, whatever color you would call this piece of paper, um, we have listed out the different kinds of fees that are authorized by statute that municipalities um, are allowed to, um, to have fees for this. After you've determined that there can be a fee, after the town's determined there can be a fee, then you have to ask what is the appropriate level of cost recovery? Is this something that should be 100% reimbursed so that it's completely covered by the fees? So, for example, with the water and sewer, you want all your direct costs, your indirect costs, your depreciation costs. You want everything included in there so that you're recovering all the costs associated with that. Or is it something that maybe having a town subsidy may make sense. Now, as Steve said, in his town, he's looking for um, the rec department to be fully 100% reimbursable. Some towns may look at the rec department and say, you know, we think it's important that we offer some senior programs and we don't necessarily care if we recover 100% of the cost because we think that's a good service to provide to our elderly citizens. So maybe for those senior programs, recovering 50% of the cost is sufficient, whereas some of the adult programs, like the, you know, the, the, the trip to the Boston Flower Show, yeah, we want to co cover, we don't want to be subsidizing that. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a, a, you can have a spectrum of, again, even within the, your own department, of where these fees should be and what is the goal. 100% reimbursement, some subsidy, or completely subsidized. And what's important in looking at those fees, though, is understanding what is the cost. You know, you got to understand what the total cost is before you can make the decision of do we want the whole thing covered and reimbursed or do we want to have some subsidy. Um, and then where is this money going to be accounted for? Is it just going to flow through the general fund as just a general fund revenue, a general fund expenditure, or is it going to go through a special revenue fund or a revolving fund if it's allowed as a revolving fund? So in terms of special revenue versus revolving funds, I just wanted to highlight what is the difference between those two. The special revenue fund the, the big difference here is with the special revenue fund is the revenue coming in is isolated, is segregated to that special revenue fund, but it still requires an appropriation to spend from that, okay? So the legislative body has decided we're taking this fee, so let's say it's the transfer station, the fees at the transfer station, we're going to put those into a special revenue fund for the purpose of dealing with the expenses of the transfer station. If it's in the special revenue fund, it still has to go back to town meeting every year to appropriate that money out of the special revenue fund. All you've done is you've taken that revenue out of the general fund so it's no longer part of your general fund revenues, but it still has to have that appropriation by town meeting. The revolving fund, and the revolving funds are limited to certain, um, certain activities by statute. The revolving funds are really for those kinds of things that are hard to predict how much you're going to need. How many ambulance calls are you going to have where you're going to be charging ambulance fees? How much special detail are your police going to be doing? Those things can be hard to predict year to year to year. And that's why some of those um, categories or those um, you know, types of activities are in a revolving fund. Once you set up that revolving fund for special police detail, the idea is the police are going to do the special detail, they're going to get paid, and you're going to charge, let's say it's the vendor that's hiring them, and you're going to charge them a sufficient amount to cover not only the salaries, but the benefits, and, and maybe some overhead costs, and it's going to come in, it's going to cover all those costs, and it's, that fund is just going to keep going. And then you don't have to worry about 
appropriating every year for that because you don't know how much special detail you're going to need. And the example I would use there, there was one town where they got hit very severely with the ice storm. They had public service in for about 18 months doing road work on all the trees that had all the damage from the ice storm, and they wanted special police detail for that whole year and a half. Now, that town never could have predicted the level of special detail, because remember, special detail is being paid by somebody else. They couldn't have predicted that in their budget, how much time public service was going to want for that special detail. So that's just a good example of where a revolving fund like that can be very beneficial from a budgetary standpoint. Um, another funding opportunity is uh, grants. If you're lucky enough to find somebody that wants to provide grant money to you, I think Steve did mention um, 3195B is, um, is the statute that it's called unanticipated revenue. It allows a municipality, if you've accepted, uh, if you've adopted 3195B, which probably you have, um, it allows you to apply for, accept, and expend without further legislative body action any money that becomes available. So that's, that's a great um, thing to have so that you don't have to wait till the next town meeting to accept, expect that money and, uh, accept that money and appropriate it. You can do it any time that becomes available during the year. Um, however, there is a caveat, and that caveat is it cannot require the expenditure of other unappropriated funds. So that could be a little tricky, for example, if there's, if there's a grant that comes available and they say, we'll give you 75% uh, of the cost and you have, to, you have a match of 25%. If you haven't appropriated the 25% match, you really can't use 3195B to do that because it requires the expenditures of other funds. If you haven't appropriated that other money for that match, okay? Um, <clears throat> there is a public notice requirement, and this was uh, changed fairly recently in 2014. If you, um, if, if the amount is less than 10,000, you just have to, the, the governing body just has to have a public notice. If it's over 10,000, they have to hold a public hearing on that. Um, the other um, area where some money may be coming from or may not be coming from is the aid from the state of New Hampshire. Um, this is a graph that shows uh, the last 10 years of state aid to municipalities, and these are total dollars, not just Hampton's dollars, okay, but it's total dollars. Um, and this does not include the education funding, so it does not include what school districts get from the state. This is just the municipal portion. And so as you can see in about 2009, is thing? so 2009, it was about um, $150 million that was coming to municipalities. The green is what's called general funding. This was the highway block grant, and this was the um, water uh, grants from the Department of Environmental Services for water sewer projects. The big drop here, was when the state was facing the recession in 2008, 2009, they started reducing the funding that was coming to municipalities. The big ones there were revenue sharing. Revenue sharing had been a program that provided $25 million. Um, it has a long history. It goes, it goes way back to when the state put in the business profits tax and started taxing businesses at the state level as opposed to businesses being uh, taxed locally. Um, before that period, and the idea was to share that revenue with municipalities. It had been about $25 million. It got suspended, and it has been suspended ever since. Uh, so that was a big chunk. The other big chunk of money that the state um, started uh, eliminating was the pension contribution for teachers, police, and firefighters. The state was providing 35% of that, um, that pension cost for those three categories. So obviously the police and fire are going to hit you, teachers are going to hit the school districts. Um, and that was gradually eliminated. Um, my estimate right now is that if the state was still paying for those, the teachers, police and fire, that would be about $80 million a year um, is what they would be paying to local governments. 
So this just gives you sort of a picture, you know, how they say picture's worth a thousand words. Well, a picture's worth a thousand numbers. So here's the picture of where we are there. Um, one of the things I wanted to explain is um, where are we with the highway funding uh, in the legislature? Because there was quite a bit of um, press about that when the governor first came out with her budget and uh, when the House came out with their budget. If you recall, uh, last year there was quite a bit of activity legislatively about what's called the gas tax. It's really a road toll. It's really a user fee. It's a tax on gasoline. And the more you use, the more you pay. It's, it's a user fee, um, but it does go by the term gas tax. Um, because of the conditions of roads, conditions of bridges in the state, conditions of the I-93 <coughs> expansion between the Massachusetts border and uh, Manchester not having enough money to finish that construction, and the fact that our highway fund just wasn't generating enough money to cover all these needs, there was uh, a recognition that something had to happen. And last year, the gas tax was increased. Now. People involved, legislators involved in this knew that they probably needed to increase it by about 12 to 15 cents a gallon. Had not been increased in 20 years. They knew they had to go up by about 12 or 15 cents, but they passed a four cent increase. Okay. Basically, this is what they said that would do last year. It was going to raise about 33 million each year. And this money, this was going to go to local block grants starting in fiscal year 16, so that's the year that starts July 1st of 15. Four million was going to go to municipalities. They were going to um, do the debt service on I-93. Um, they didn't need it right away because they had to bond it and then they've got to start paying it back. So that's why um, it kicked in a couple of years. State bridge aid, <coughs> municipal bridges. If you have a bridge, if back here, back then, if you had a bridge that you needed to apply for state bridge aid, and state bridge aid is the state pays 80% and you, you come up with a 20% match. Um, you had an 8 to 10 year wait. That's how long <coughs> you would have uh, for, to get any funding from the state. That's how long their wait list was. Historically, they had only appropriated $6.8 million, enough to do, you know, maybe eight, nine bridges. And there were uh, th over 350 municipal bridges that are considered red listed bridges. Okay, that doesn't include the state red listed bridges. These are just municipally owned red listed bridges. The commissioner at the Department of Transportation, the former commissioner, called it the measles map, the one that has all those red listed municipal bridges. All he called it the measles maps, and he said that was what he lost sleep over at night was those municipal red listed bridges. So obviously, something needed to be done. So part of this four cent increase was going to double the amount of bridge aid with the idea of shrinking that wait list. So it wasn't a 10-year list. It would come down to something like a four or five-year list. Um, and then there was uh, these, this is all money going to the state to do their betterment programs on state roads. I kind of call them the connecting roads, those roads that, the state roads that connect all the towns, you know, that yeah. obviously you know what the conditions of those are like. Um, so that's what that was for. So this was what the statute says. Four cent increase, this is where it's going to go. So, that's what everybody expected. This is what was expected, at least from the municipal standpoint. This is what the highway funding had been. There was the block grant, 12% of whatever comes into the highway fund from the gas tax and from motor vehicle fees, 12% goes to municipalities. And then there had been the bridge aid, so it had been 37 million. This four cent increase was gonna give four, four million more to that highway block grant and double the bridge aid, so 6.8. So it was going to be a total of 48.4 million. When the bill passed, which municipalities supported, that's what was expected. When the governor came out with her proposal, <laughs> she said, okay, I can't cut anything, I can't cut any of this money because that's what the law said, that four cents, this is where it's going to go, so I'll just cut the underlying grant. So she cut the bridge aid, okay? What did the House do in their budget? They said, well, we kinda, we're kind of we kind of interested in what the governor did, so we'll not only accept her cutting the bridge aid, we'll reduce the highway block grant by $4 million. Okay. So again, they will tell you, they would say, 
We didn't cut the funding from the, the four cent gas tax increase. You're still getting that funding, but they cut the underlying amounts. So what did that actually end up doing? There's what municipalities were getting before the gas tax went in last year. There's what they were going to get with the House budget, basically the same numbers, which was really very discouraging for us because, again, municipalities had supported that because of the need and, and because of the promise that was there. But um, where are we right now? Um, yesterday, the Senate put back the $4 million for each year. So the Senate put back the $4 million. I don't know what they're going to do with the bridge aid. Um, they recognize that that is an issue. Um, there is still the issue that the four cents wasn't really sufficient to fund the state's highway fund and all those needs. Uh, but they will be meeting tomorrow and Thursday, and we are hoping that they will uh, put that $6.8 million back so that it's just it's just unacceptable that there's a 10-year wait uh, to deal with these bridges. So that's where that one is. Um, meals and rooms tax distribution. Every municipality gets um, a share of the meals and rooms tax that comes into the state. This is one of the state's healthiest taxes in terms of its growth and how well it's doing. And you guys, uh, you know, living in a tourist community, you are certainly a aware of um, that tourism is a big issue here, and the meals and rooms tax um, is certainly, as I said, one of the, the biggest uh, state revenue sources. Under state law, when that tax first went in, in 1967, that law went in and said 60% of the money coming in will go to the state, 40% will go to municipalities. It's going to be a sharing. I can tell you that municipalities have never received anywhere close to 40% of the meals and rooms tax. And because the amount that was going to municipalities was so low, back in 1993 there was a catch-up formula that was put in because obviously the state couldn't all of a sudden give municipalities 40 percent. It would be too much of a loss to them. So what they did is they put a catch-up formula in and they said, okay, if the meals and rooms tax comes in higher one year than it did the previous year, 75 percent of that increase will go towards municipalities distribution with a cap of five million. So never more than five million. So if the money came in ten million more, it would be seventy five percent would be seven point five million, but we're gonna cap it at five. But if the money came in, let's say only a million higher, well then seventy five percent would be seven hundred and fifty thousand. So it was seventy five percent of the increase, but never more than five million. And the idea was to gradually increase the, pro the proportion going to municipalities, okay? So that catch-up formula was in for a number of years. It was doing what it was supposed to do until, again, that recession hit, and that was one of the things the state suspended, and they said, we're going to freeze it at $58.8 million uh, for a while. So that's what they did. Um, it did resume this past year. So municipalities got an extra $5 million in the check they got last December. Okay, they, and I think for Hampton it was about sixty thousand dollars more came in from the meals and rooms distribution because that catch-up formula kicked in again. Okay, um, here's just a graph showing you what's the percentage. Again, here's the forty percent. You could see back in two thousand one it was about seventeen, eighteen percent, and it was doing what it was intended to do. That catch-up formula it was gradually increasing until boom, they suspended it. And not only did they suspend it, but they raised the rate at the same time. So the tax rate went from 8.5% to 9%. The state got a lot more money that year, and because the municipal piece had been frozen, the percentage kind of took a, a, a big dive. So right now, um, it's at about 25%. So um, the governor... Um, Oh, and if it had not been suspended, again, my estimate would have been rather than getting $63 million sharing in $63 million last December, you would have been sharing in $76 million. Um, and over this period of time when they suspended the catch-up formula, that was about $41 million that the state didn't provide to municipalities. Um, so where are we right now with that? Um, the governor suspended it for the first year in her budget 
The House suspended it for both years. The Senate today um, put the catch-up formula back in for the second year of the biennium. Um, and again, as I said, what, the real kicker with this is that the Meals and Rooms tax revenue is coming in really strong. It's about $15 million over where it was last year. So municipalities could get that $5 million, and the state would still have another $10 million more than what they had planned. Um, but the state is having some challenges with their budget. So that's where that is. Um, I, I should have prefaced and say I don't really have a lot of good news for you with this, with this part of it. But um, the state aid environmental grants, these are the, the grants for water and wastewater projects under current law. Um, the state is supposed to fund those at a 20% match. In some cases, it can be up to 30%. And they pay it back over the terms of the financing. So if you've taken out a bond and you're paying it back over 20 years, the intent is that the state is going to pay that 20% as you're making those debt payments going forward over 20 years. So they're not going to give you the whole 20% of the project up front. They're going to pay it to you as you're paying off your debt. Okay. Um, for a period from 2009 to 2013, they stopped approving any new grants. Um, and these projects were placed on what was called a delayed and deferred list, basically saying, you know, keep doing what you're doing and someday we'll hopefully the state will give you the money. Um, there was a moratorium was placed on any new projects that or at placed on any projects that received local approval after December of 2008. So basically what they were saying was if if you, if municipalities went to their town meeting before December 2008 to to approve these projects and the voters understood there's going to be a 20% share of the state will honor that. But if you know, December 2008, they started getting word out that, you know, the state doesn't have a lot of money here, so you, if you proceeded with any projects after that time, you did so at your own peril. So that's sort of the, where that December 2008 comes in. Um, in terms of the governor and the House and the Senate budget, they have uh, funded all those existing obligations, so anything that had already been receiving uh, payments and you're still on that sort of the tail to pay it off, those are funded, but they are not looking at granting any, any new projects since that um, December 2008. Um, and again, this is just a picture's worth a thousand words, so it shows, you know, what had been the level of funding, you know, about 17 million, 16, 17 million, and then when this moratorium went in, what they have to pay was dropping down because, again, as they're paid it off, as the debt payments are made, eventually some of the projects, they get paid off. So there's less and less and less they have to pay. This little bump up was when they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for that de delayed and deferred list, this last budget go around. Um, they, they did pay for the pro some of the projects on that list, but now we're back into this phase where they're saying we're not doing anything now. They did, um, both the House and Senate did pass a bill to set up a study committee to look at this program and determine if and how this should go forward, should there be you know a change in the criteria for some of these projects? Um, where what should the funding source be? So it will be studied, and we'll see where that takes us. And finally, I did want to show you um, this. This is the um, what's happened to the local employer rates for pensions because of the fact that the state stopped making those contributions. So you can see um, that was in about 2009. I think they started ratcheting it down. I mean, there, there clearly there are other reasons why the pension costs increase, but um, from your standpoint, one of the big reasons was the um, contribution towards police and fire. Hopefully we have the red line is the fire and the blue line is the police. Sometimes I get those backwards, <laughs> maybe wrong, the, the wrong colors for those. But um, yeah, so you know, pretty big increases here, and a, a lot of that is because the state stopped those contributions. So, in terms of you know, what can you expect um, from state aid right now? Where that stands with the Senate is um, is the highway block grant money is coming, that is supposed to be coming. Uh, we don't know where things are with that bridge aid. 
and they funded the um, additional money from the meals and rooms in the second year of the biennium. So that's what's kind of coming coming back. In terms of those environmental grants, neither the House or Senate is looking at funding those. Um, and I think those are sort of the, the big issues. Revenue sharing, that $25 million in revenue sharing, it's still being suspended and nobody's talking about that coming back. Um, again, in terms, back to... Uh, so how do you how do you fund your budget? I think Steve mentioned too. You can use um, your general fund balance, as he said. The authority to spend lapses at year end, and what happens when that money lapses? So you have an appropriation of you know ten thousand dollars, but you only spend eight thousand. What happens to that other two thousand dollars that you had the authority to spend? You raise the money either through the tax rate or whatever, and then you didn't spend it. It becomes part of what's called the fund balance. So that your fund balance grows by not spending all your appropriations that you're authorized or by bringing in more money than you planned. So if you thought you were going to bring in a million dollars in motor vehicle fees and you brought in one million one hundred thousand dollars because a lot of people started buying newer cars, that excess hundred thousand because your tax rate was set based on that one million dollars. So that extra hundred thousand kind of becomes part of your fund balance. You don't get to spend that extra 100000 because remember, you're locked into that bottom line appropriation. So that's where um, your, ex your fund balance grows. And you do have to take into account taxes that haven't been collected or other bills that you haven't paid. But that's generally what it is. Um, what do you do with the fund balance? You, re you re can you retain it for cash flow purposes? I'm sure your town treasurer would say, no, you, you, you got to be careful because there are times when they, the treasurer has to make payments to the school district. You got to make payments to the county. You know, you've got to have money for cash flow. Most towns try to avoid having to issue tax anticipation notes, and that's where your cash comes in. You know, having that in hand to cover that. Um, it can be a source of Revenues for future appropriations often see to raise and appropriate ten thousand dollars for XYZ project to come from fund balance. A lot of times that will be sold as uh, it's not going to cost anything because we're going to take it from fund balance. Well, it's the way to kind of that spin has, it. I have to say that's the one that drives me crazy. I'm sure you can see it does a lot of things that drive me crazy. The select board says. Oh, this has no tax effect. I said, that's just malarkey. That was money raised two years ago. It has a tax effect. Don't ever say that. That's awful. And part of it is it can be used to reduce the taxes. The, the governing body can determine how much of the fund balance they want to use, what, how much at the time the tax rate's being set, how much do we want to use of our fund balance to hold down the tax rate? Well, if you've taken this 10000 and that 20000 and you put it all on specific articles, that just makes that pot smaller. You're not just not going to have it. So, I don't know, a good good selling point It's for some. <laughs> you know. um, as Steve mentioned, um, retaining it and the recommendation, it, ooh, re recommendation is to uh, have a certain amount that you're retaining we recommend that the, you have a, that the governing body have a policy in place so that this isn't something that they're deciding every single year. That they have a policy with sort of a goal as to what do we want our um, you know our level of fund balance to be, what's appropriate for us. Um, and with that said, I wanted to get into just a little bit of a discussion about the property taxes. And this is this is actually spread out on a building in Washington D.C. This whole thing, taxes are what we pay for a civilized society. It's on the IRS building. <laughs> so, um, a few words about property taxes. Um, it's the tax people love to hate, and unfortunately, it's the primary funding sources of lo source of local government funding in New Hampshire. It's what uh, we all have to live with, as you know probably better than uh, most people uh, in your town. Um, there are some benefits from a some from a philosophy standpoint. There are some benefits to property taxes. It is a relatively stable source of revenue compared to other what's called other broad-based taxes like sales taxes or income taxes. It is uh, relatively stable. It hits those non-residents um, as opposed to um, an income tax, which would only hit your residents. Um, it's locally levied and administered, and there's certainly um, you know some 
some perceptions that taxes that are more locally assessed and collected or closer to the citizens um, are more reflective of the services they want than the state assessing a tax and deciding what goes back. Um, there can be an argument that property taxes finance property related services, your water, your sewer, your plowing, the you know quality of life with your library and those kinds of things. Property taxes are very difficult to evade as opposed to something like um, sales taxes, you know, so that you, you know where your town boundaries are. You know the property in your town. So they're very, it's very difficult to evade property taxes. And it promotes local autonomy. It reflects your local priorities. We often say that your budget is basically, it's your, it's your um, fiscal philosophy for the town. And that budget is, is what's, you know, going to equate to the property taxes. So the two of them are integral to each other. It's, it's your priorities and then paying for them, although sometimes some of your citizens may forget that what they voted for in March is now what they have to pay the bill for in December. Um, for the property tax process, there's basically generally four steps. It's the appraisal process, a revaluation process that is usually occurs um, at least every five years. Then there's the assessment process. The difference between the appraisal and the assessment is the assessment is pulling in some of those statutory exemptions and the statutory credits, like your elderly exemptions or those religious charitable entities um, that are exempt, and things like your veterans' credits. Um, the rate is um, computed per thousand dollars of assessment, and then there's the collection process where it's levied. There's that um, warrant that goes from the selectmen as the assessors to the tax collector, giving the tax collector the authority to bill this. There, there's a leaning process on those delinquent taxes and ultimately a deeding process if those taxes aren't collected. So that's sort of the four phases of the property tax. In terms of calculating the tax rate, mm -hmm. it's your gross appropriation. So whatever the bottom line is that the, the voters approved back in March, less revenues other than property taxes this is and this is general but so you can take out those other revenues like your motor vehicle fees or um, land use change tax fees or you know the, the federal the state money coming in those things go to add back what's called overlay those overlays to cover abatements um, and then these war service credits that's the veterans credits because even though those veterans are getting a reduction you still have to raise the full amount of your budget so if you're giving you a reduction, everybody else has to pay for that, okay? Um, and that's the net municipal tax effect. Um, you divide that by the assessed value and it's expressed per thousand dollars of valuation. So that's kind of a simple uh, explanation of the formula. Here's just a quick, uh, some dollars. Yes, I see the time. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm looking I, at the I, I'm looking at my, at my email. <laughs> oh, you're not paying attention to me. No, no, no I was so worried the, about my wife sending me an email. 20 million in appropriations, 8 million in revenues, very little overlay. I guess they thought they have a really good assessor. They're not going to be much for abatements. And they have uh, uh, quite a few veterans, so they're going to add that back. They're going to raise 12 million. Here's what their assessed value is. So they had an $8.95 rate. Um, similarly, it's very similar with the school district rate. Now, you have the Hampton School District, and you're part of Winniconnet. Correct. Correct. So you've got two school districts. Similar process, the only thing is with that cooperative school district, there's a cooperative school district agreement that says how are you going to share those right. costs with those other towns. That's just another piece of the calculation, but it's pretty much the same thing. The state education tax, which is uh, on the tax bills too, that is something that is uh, really decided by statute, and the law has been $363 million a year. Set the tax rate statewide based on equalized property value, sufficient to raise $363 million. That gets divvied up to each town, and then DRA um, figures out how much your share of that is going to be, or you know what's going to come from Hampton as their share towards that $363 million. A county tax rate, again, very similar to the process, the appropriations, less the revenues. With the county, it's based on your equalized property value. What portion is Hampton of, what county are we in? Rockingham. Rockingham. Okay, so maybe you're, I don't know, maybe you're 15% of that, so you're going to pick up 15% of the cost of the counties. Um, so here's the last piece. What's it going to cost on the tax rate? And we call this the three-finger rule. 
Okay, so in that sample town that I gave you, they have an assessed value of $1.4 billion. So the three finger rule says, and I have to get up here to show you this, the three finger rule says, you take three fingers, you're going to cover the last three digits. Uh. That is a dollar on the tax rate. Yeah. If you cover four digits, that is 10 cents on the tax rate. If you cover five digits, that is a penny on the tax rate. Wow. So, hmm. once you know that, you can look at something and like a $400 fire truck and say, okay, that $400 fire truck, if this is the amount that's a dollar on the tax rate, what's a $400 fire truck? $400,000. I mean, so I'm sorry, <laughs> $400,000 sorry, $400, fire truck divided by the amount that's a dollar on the tax rate? It's going to be 28 cents on your tax rate. If you had a collective bargaining agreement that had a cost item of $25,000 divided by the amount that's a dollar on the tax rate, that would be about just under two cents. Mm. It will work. It will work for revenues and expenditures. Wow. So if all of a sudden you say the state is going to give you $60,000 more in meals and rooms revenue, how much would that be on your tax rate? Or if you wanted to do a $500,000 project, how much is that going to cost? So what I've given you is this green sheet, and I looked back to see what was your 2014 valuation. So this is what was on the DRA's website for your net assessed valuation in Hampton in 2014. Why did I use 2014? Because we don't know what the 2015 is because your assessor is still doing all that work, okay? So this was the most recent one. So what you do is cover up those last three digits. So what's what's the dollar on your tax rate? There it is. And I had, where's my little number? Where's my <laughs> cheat sheet? Ah. So 2.7 million, that's a dollar on your tax rate. 10 cents would be one digit less. So about 278,000 is 10 cents on your tax rate. About 27, 28,000 is a penny on your tax rate. Okay? So if you had a project that was going to be cost you $550,000, if you divided that by line two, what's a dollar on your tax rate, it would come out to about 20 cents. That $25,000 cost item, if you divide it by what's on line two, it would be about a little less than a penny. So here's the caveat I have to give you with this, because your assessor would hand my my hand me my head if I didn't tell you this. As I said, this is based on your 2014 tax rate. Come fall, you're going to have a 2015 assessed value. I mean, yeah, it's on your 2014 assessed value. You're going to have a new assessed value in the middle of September. You're going to have your April 1st, 2015 is the assessment date. Your assessor is supposedly going to be sending in the MS-1 form to DRA around the middle of September. You're going to have a new value for 2015. That's your homework assignment in September to get that local assessed value. So as you're doing the budget next year, you can have an estimate of what items will cost or what the you know the revenue impact and again these are only estimates because come 2016 there's going to be a new assessed value for 2016 right. what this is intended to do is to help you determine if something's going to cost pennies nickels dimes or dollars on the tax rate to give you just an estimate of what that is okay all right where's the clicker here? and I think um, just a couple of other comments on some handouts and things for you. Um, one of the things I gave you was an article that we did on the property tax. Um, this was in, I think, 2013. We did this, Understanding the Math and Dispelling the Myth. It gets in the, into a little bit of discussion of what is equalization and what's it trying to do and, and the whole tax rate setting process. Um, the other thing I found was this book, uh, a guide to, Governing Magazine's Guide to financial literacy and it says connecting money policy and priorities this it can't you can't buy the book but you can download it at that website and this is a guide that was geared towards elected officials who may not be government accountants 
to help you understand the terminology, to kind of understand the concept of pensions and direct costs and indirect costs and who is the GASB and what is OCBOA and all these acronyms that get thrown around by your auditors and things. So it's just a great handy little book geared specifically to you folks who don't necessarily have an accounting background. Um, and as Steve also mentioned earlier, we have some other training coming up. Um, you've got some of those flyers on there. And uh, can I just remind you that you're all municipal officials. You can contact them through the advisory service. You can tell, tell, send us an email at legalinquiries at nhmunicipal.org. You can call us at 224-7447 or toll free 1-800-852-3358. We're there, 8.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. We try to get you a response within the same day, usually the day later, and it will be uh, an email. Sometimes it's a letter or a telephone call. Except and, uh, for me. I'm at the legislature trying to figure out what they're doing with the budget. So you may, you may hear back from me at night. <laughs> so you're either going to be hearing from myself or my, my colleague, Margaret Burns, and we're here to help you do your job better. And so we hope that this has helped you do your job better as a budget committee. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, Barbara Reed and Attorney Stephen Buckley, I want to thank you for joining sure. us tonight. Certainly, that was a rapid fire. <laughs> but, you know, it took all the tedium out of sitting through it for eight hours, too. I want to thank you. That was a tremendous <laughs> amount of information, I believe, oh. beneficial to especially the newcomers, but even to those of us who have listened before, I always learn something new, as I'm sure my colleagues do. Great. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Chairman. And I have filled out my yellow card, but I'm, you, you need to make a small correction Uh oh. Yeah, on page 5. The top block, well, it's, it's something uh, under appropriations, proper public purpose, school district. RSA 198-4, limited to support of public schools. That is not completely accurate. The, you can raise and appropriate for uh, private slash religious schools only for the students that are contained in that school. That's a, a strange uh, twist mm -hmm. in the New Hampshire law, but we have a warrant article every year, a petition warrant article, for students at uh, Sacred Heart School in Hampton. Just mm -hmm. the number of school just the number of children from Hampton who attend that private religious school. So you want to uh, check, and I do not remember the statute, but there is a statute whereby you're allowed to do that. Mary and Louise, thank you for the notation. In communities. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all you members who have attended tonight. I'm going to ask for a motion to I'll adjourn move to at adjourn second. Nine eight. I move to adjourn. Jim seconded it. Nine oh eight. Nine oh eight. Just one little quick thing.